All right, welcome to The Rant, episode three, the best bowling show in the world. And of course, it's really special today because I have a fantastic special guest, <laughs> Phil Cardinelli, CEO and president of Radical Bowling, the fastest growing brand in the bowling industry. How does that sound, Phil? That sounds fantastic, doesn't it? You know, it's funny. Um, God, with all the companies I had over my life, and then you get involved with Radical and... You know, we, we, were, we did good, and then we got a little stagnant, and I know why. I figured out why. Mm. And then I made some, some changes. And in the last two years, leaps and bounds, um, almost to the point where it's unbelievable. Sure. You know, I mean, that growth is just, it's just phenomenal. And the market is pretty flat, so somebody's losing business to us. You it's, it's, it's not you guys, that's for sure. Okay, <laughs> so this is the first in a three-part series. Uh, yeah. I like to think of this one as, in the beginning, there was Phil. So, <laughs> you know, want to know about you in particular. Okay. When you started off, how, how young were you when you got in bowling? Growing up, how did you get involved? Okay. And just the early years. Uh, well, it's interesting, um, and it's a fun story for me. But, you know, I grew up in Brooklyn, um, Bedford Stuyvesant moved to East New York, and I went to college. I was a baseball player. I didn't even bowl, really, until until I got out of college. Oh, um, I think it was my senior year. I joined a league. Um, it was a, a church league, St. Rita's Holy Name Society. My dad bowled in it. Uh, I was 113. Wow, 113. Yeah, really Man, you're really rolling it, rolling in the scores there, buddy. <laughs> I'm telling you, it was pretty funny. Um, but I averaged 113, and I, I caught on. I loved the game. And then I joined another league. We bowled at Americana Bowl in, in, uh, in Ozone Park. Um, How old are you at this better. time? God, I was just – I must have been 21. Okay, so you did some early just, other sports. You got out of school. I played baseball. That was it, baseball. baseball. Yeah. Brooklyn, yeah. go to college, and then you started yeah. getting in bowling. And yeah, yeah. You were bowling at 113. Cool. My first year, 113 okay. average. It was pretty exciting. Um but then after that, I, I got pretty good in a hurry. I went like 113, 170. Oh. And then I was in the 180s. And by the third year, I was averaging a little over 190. Okay. And that was in the days when you're top five average, 190. So let's let's just set some context yeah. here. You're still going yeah. to college in Brooklyn, right? Right. Yeah, and no, Queens College, right. Queens yes, college. I lived in Brooklyn, right. I moved to Long Island. Okay. And what yeah. year was this? I graduated college in 74. Okay, that's two years before I was born. So, <laughs> uh, so seventy three. It was probably okay. when I started when I picked up a bowling ball for the first time. Okay, and you, know, you, yeah, you, you yeah. guys using rubber? You using? Uh, you know what? My first bowling ball was an Ace rubber ball that my dad bought me at Models, which is a department sporting goods store. Nice. That's where I had it drilled. Okay, that was my first bowling ball. Um, ironically enough, I liked that ball so much that as I got better, I went and bought another one and didn't drill it, went and drilled it at a pro shop, oh. but it was an ACE hard rubber bowling ball. Um, I loved it. I mean, it was fantastic. You know, um, I bowled, I, and I started bowling action when I got to be 190 average at the time. Really? Uh, and that was my, my only ball. I mean, that's all I had. I loved it. I absolutely so loved it. I love you, the competition. You did pot bowling with one Absolutely. rubber ball. That was it. That was it. <laughs> yeah, and you know what? I, I, pot bowling and action, two different things. Pot bowling is you go to and 10 guys put in $20 a piece and you bowl games. This was go to a house and challenge somebody. Oh. A one-on-one -on, -one on the lanes. That's what I like. You know, I like that a lot. Uh, and that was fun. And then, you know, I got into – I started studying. And when I was in college, I, I studied a lot of different things. Physics was one of the things, and, and I got involved in the dynamics of a bowling ball. Now, you got to realize at the time, I think the hammer ball wasn't even out yet. So you were just drilling three-piece pancake weight blocks. Okay. So when the hammer ball came out, I got excited about it. There was some dynamics. And a buddy of mine owned a pro shop, two of my buddies, and I would go in there and just study bowling balls and, um, and figure out how to drill them. Um, different ways. I read a lot as much of the information that was available. You know, it was funny, but how I got involved in the bowling business is really a cool story. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. I mean, this is my favorite story. So I bowled in the league on Thursday night at, uh, in Long Island, Maroki lanes, Maroki classic league. It was really a, a, an impossible shot. 
Um, Don Janello bowled. You remember the name Don Janello? Mm -hmm. He won out on tour. Uh, he was at 201. One other guy averaged 200 the, the previous year before I joined. At any rate, I joined the following year. And um, the year's going well, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to average 200. Maybe one or two guys in the whole league. But there's a guy in the league, and a buddy of mine named is George N. And we used to meet in a coffee shop before league. It was a late league. So he walks in one day with a picture of a bowling ball. It was a Star Trek equalizer. And he says to me, can you drill this? I was cocky. I said, yeah, I can drill any. Let me see it. He said, I'll make a deal with you. You drill a ball. And if either one of us shoot an award score, and they wouldn't know award scores in those days. It wasn't like they were just coming out. He said, I'll pay for both balls. If not, you know, we'll pick a time, and, that, and at the end of that time, you just pay me for the ball. I said, great. So the balls come in. I'll never forget. They came in on, on, a, on a Monday. And George bowled in league with me on a Wednesday, and then we bowled again on Thursday. So he says to me, you're going to drill it for me. I said, well, I want to look at it. Let me study it. No, I want to have it. I want to have it. So I take the drill sheet out of the box, and I drill him the ball. And the ball rolled okay. Mm -hmm. but I wouldn't drill mine yet. <laughs> you know, I, I looked at the picture. I did some measuring. and So I drew mine for the following week, and the first game out of the box, I shoot two ninety nine. <laughs> first game out of the box. Ooh. So the award score, I win, right? Yeah. He pays for the balls. So he says to me, why does your ball roll so good and mine doesn't? I said, the drill sheet was wrong. Wow. He says, are you serious? I go, look, let me show you. So I show him on the drill sheet. The drill sheet was 90 degrees off. The way the core was laying in the ball and the way the drill sheet was 90 degrees off. So he says, you got to call the company. I said, you know what? I, I, you know, I, I worked for Eaton Corporation. I was a financial analyst. Um, I worked on the uh, F-15 fighter jet projects and stuff like that. I was enjoying what I was doing. So anyhow, he says, call the company. So I call the company up. I tell the guy that answered the phone, hey, your drill sheet's wrong. <laughs> he, he says to me, what makes you say that? I go, well, physics, it's wrong. So he says, well, can you help us? I said, listen, I'm not going to give you the key to the kingdom here for nothing. Mm -hmm. He said, how about I send you a couple of cases of balls? You help us out with the drill sheet. So I did. I told him where they were wrong. But literally, God, three weeks later, I get a phone call from a company that Star Trek had owed a bunch of money to for resin. And okay. the guy had taken over the company. So he says to me, can I fly you out here? This is Cleveland, into Cleveland, Solon, Ohio. I said, sure. So he sends me a ticket. I fly out, and I'm pissed about this. You have no idea how mad I am. It was the week they were going up to Rochester, all my buddies, to both state tournaments. I couldn't oh. go to that weekend. I was fuming. But I said, you know what? I can't miss up this opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I fly to Solon, Ohio. I go look at the guy's stuff. I said, you got a lot of problems here. These balls are all out of spec. You're getting bad stuff. He says, what's it going to take to have you come and work for me? I said, well, I'm a senior financial analyst at Eaton Corporation. This is what I make. He goes, I'll match it. So that Labor Day, I pack up my car and I move to Solon, Ohio to help this guy. Because so the, the company owed him a lot of money. Okay. So that was an 88. Um, so by these 90, are urethane, I finally, These are urethane these balls. These are urethane things. balls, right. Okay. By 90, I finally straightened out the factory a little bit. Quality is still bad and the guy's still a little shady. So I get a phone call one day. We start selling a lot of balls, too. We're selling balls. I get a phone call one day from Columbia, and Columbia says, um, you know, we noticed that you guys are making an impact in the market. We'd like to meet with you about possibly um, making your bowling balls. I said, all right. So I called, and Paul Seagott was the guy's name. I said to Paul, listen, we got a chance. I'm in favor of this because I don't want to keep watching the factory. Um, I have to leave town and sell bowling balls. You know, I, we have a lot to do. I can't be a factory manager and sell bowling balls. It ain't, it's not going to work. Right. So Columbia sends us some tickets, Paul and I, and we fly to um, O'Hare and meet him in the Admirals Club. Fly in, have a meeting, fly back home. Maybe about, I don't know, it might have been about January at that time. They said, okay, we want to build your bowling balls. We want to buy the company. Wow. So 
I said, okay, let me talk to Paul. So they cut us a deal. They bought the company. And I, I stayed in Solon, Ohio for about a year and a half. At this point, I had gotten married and I built a, uh, a house, brand new house, literally in the house a year and a half. Um, and he says, they said to me, you know, what do you want to do? And I, I kept flying down to San Antonio, meeting with them. And then one day they said, why don't you move down here? So we packed up, we moved to San Antonio. Um, and and uh, I, ran, I ran the company Track. We changed it to Track. From Star Trek to Track. From Star Trek to Track. Wow. We shut down their factory, took all their equipment, got rid of it. Um, and then I started designing all the balls for Track okay. myself. So let's, let's, let's. 1988. 1988. 1988. So right. you went right. from being into college. Yeah. Yeah. To them Never buying you before. out from a corporation to get into the business to fix a financial problem, which I right. really assume you fixed because you, you meant you sounded yeah, like you were profitable yeah. at that point. Oh, very. Well, yeah, because we were making money. The guy was getting all his money back. But the problem was I, I had a, I want to be, I wanted to sell bowling ball. Then you realize all of this started on a bet in a coffee shop on a Thursday <laughs> night. Wow. That's, yeah, a, so that's it's, incredible. It's pretty exciting, right? You're, it's so, it's so, a lot of momentum over the years. Absolutely. So as the track brand is starting to go, I got to start designing cores. You know, I knew a little bit about it. I made a few balls. You know, we did a couple of balls. It worked out pretty good. Uh, moved, to, moved to San Antonio. And then I got a chance to work with a real R&D team. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, over the years, some of the balls were pretty good for track. Yeah, you know the the heat was pretty good. I mean, yeah, that ball was unbelievable. We uh, it won eighteen consecutive games in a row on TV that it was on. It never lost except to itself. Right. Uh, the Not elite, a bad thing. Oh, no, the cold red mm -hmm. when we did the um, ceramic core. You know, I got a, I got a, I have a patent on that on a ceramic core. You have uh, a patent I'm on, on a patent. ceramic core. I'm on the patent. Yeah, it That's... was my patent. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. So things have gone well, you know. I, so what? So eighty-eight. Yeah. Track track has been invented. You're right. pouring urethane balls. Yeah. Now, yeah. what was it like at this point in your life? And how did you guys respond to the birth of reactive resin? Well, you know, a, reactive resin was a ways off, right? I mean, we're mm -hmm. doing urethane. So I get down here and. Um, I guess it was 92 or mm -hmm. 3 when Reactive Resin came. I'm not even sure the exact date. I think it was date. The, the Excalibur. It, well, yeah. Well, Steve Cooper came to us at Columbia to build it. Mm -hmm. And Steve and I hit it off because he's a tinkerer like I am. So we started talking, and his ball was incredible. That was the biggest – people talk about what was the biggest impact in the bowling industry, modern bowling, is, is Reactive Resin. They can say whatever they want about the two-hander, pick something. This is the reason the game changed. Sure. Now, why did it change? Because the American Bowling Congress decided in the system of bowling that short oil was a good idea. Hmm. When they went to 24 feet, reactive resin balls rolled great. On 36 feet, they rolled horrible. Mm -hmm. So the short oil let, let us use the chemistry and learn from it. So we started building the Excalibur ball down here for Steve Cooper, and we had a, an agreement with him, so we couldn't copy his formula. So we had uh, BASF work on some of the resins, and um, I was sort of the resident tinkerer here in, at, at Columbia, and I took some of the resins and went to the bowling center and played with them and found out that you could sand a reactive resin ball. <laughs> Surface. No, no one knew that because wow. everyone was shiny because it went sideways. Right. So I designed a ball called the Nuke, mm -hmm. green ball. Made a it was the first ball to ever have a flip block outside the core, outside the inner core. It was attached. It was a flip block, mm -hmm. and I used the BASF resin sanded, mm -hmm. and that ball just put us on the map. And then from there wow. it was on and on and on and on and oh my winner God. after winner after winner. Oh, you know, wow. Yeah, yeah. So, so the surface but, made that much of a difference. What, oh my what, God! Yeah. What was it like when? you showed people this new concept like how did they react to that well first of all they thought i was crazy because mm -hmm. every excalibur ball we made was shiny and i said well, i understand that but it's it's limited you know what i mean and and also what was great about the excalibur and i always tell people that uh 
you could shoot 620 pretty easily, 250, 150, 220. Right. You always had that spot in the middle. Well, when I started sanding these balls, that went away. They were more consistent. You know, so, and then what followed that was the, uh, with the flip blocks that I put on a ball, and then the ceramic core. And, and the, the way the ceramic core came about was really, it was just a strange um, turn of events. They were redoing the factory at Columbia mm -hmm. uh, during shutdown. And your manufacturing people sometimes don't listen to salespeople. It happens. So they ended up metering the shots to make a bowling ball. They had a metered shot. That was what the, 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 the density was going to go in. But the guy failed to realize that he used the beast. Oh, boy. He used the beast as the um, benchmark for the metered shot. But the beast density wasn't low enough to lower the RG enough in the ball. Okay? I mean, I'm not talking about the flare yet. I'm talking about the RG, right? Only. Right. So, so he, the, the density of the material he could pour with the metered shot was not low enough. He had redone the whole factor. So I needed to find a way to get a density in the center of the ball that was lower or had a, a, a high... Uh, it was more dense than what we were already using. A more core-centric uh, weight block. Yeah. So... Coors, the beer company, sold ceramic core balls, bought ceramic core balls to clean out the bins when they tumble them for making beer. They <laughs> throw them all in and they tumble them and it ships away everything on the inside. The problem was they weren't all the same weight and they weren't all the same size. Mm -hmm. So we bought a bunch of them and we started fiddling around. And the way, the way we positioned the ceramic core in a ball the first time, we were having a lunch meeting. And they brought some pizza in. And you know the little plastic things they put in the pizza box to hold yeah. it? From the box yeah. it? Well, we turned it upside down and sat the, core, the ceramic core on that and put that in the bottom of the core in the bowling ball. That's how we built the first ones until we realized what they were going to do. So, so that's the basically a light bulb style. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. And we right. put this on the bottom of it <laughs> and on the pizza stand. Right. Of course, that didn't always work. Some fell off. So we had... A, and then I went to a company in Ohio that made ceramic molded um, electronic stuff, you know, like for the power grids. Mm -hmm. And I showed them what I wanted, and they built me a ball, a ceramic core, with a hole in it that I could put on a pin. Oh. And we got a patent. And that's how we lowered the density. That's how we realized lower RG was good. Sure. Because people couldn't get that low. You know, so it was, it was crazy. You know, and then once we built the ceramic core, the critical mass, the code red, mm -hmm. it went crazy. We went crazy. You know, we were just selling all high-end balls, premium, premium balls. So this is like pioneering stuff that's happening in the industry. You know, this Absolutely. is new stuff, Absolutely. new to the market. Yep. Now, Absolutely. bowling, like every other industry out there, has the same problem where companies copy each other. Yes. So yes. what was happening during that time when you come out with something? Were other companies copying you? Yeah, what happened was when I did the flip block, and that's the one I should have got the, the patent on. Mm -hmm. And I took a core, and the way I made the ball was unbelievable. I, I went to um, Toys R Us, and I bought, <laughs> that's fantastic. I bought those red balls. You know the red balls the kids have, and you mm -hmm. throw them, the dodgeball? Mm -hmm. Okay, they had different size ones. I bought a smaller one. Cut it in half, and I made a round core out of it. Okay? Then I went to Home Depot. Oh, and I bought PVC. It was about three inches round, and I cut it in one-inch slices. I put them on a table with clay around them and poured the top weight in that. Okay. Then I glued the top weight on top of that ball, and I made a core. You did so this, I was you able to at home or at the, at the office at the factory. Okay. You know, yeah, I had my own little section. I did that, you know, so it was pretty cool because then I ended up with a ball that had a round core, but the flip, the, the weight block, the pancake weight block was closer to the surface. Mm -hmm. So it flared more. Oh yeah. So, so these and then companies... that got copied in a hurry. That got right. copied instantly. Now, did yeah. you, did you, when you see a company copy you, like, how did you yeah. respond in those days? Um, you know what? It was funny because I was already on the next thing. You know, like Eb and I came out with Ceram X, and it mm -hmm. was a ceramic core that you couldn't fire it because I had that in my patent that it could not be drillable. 
So I went to a trade show one time with a box of ceramic cores that were not fired and a mm -hmm. box that were, and I just smashed them together and showed people how one crumbled and one didn't. Mm -hmm. It was just a selling pitch. You know, and, and I mean, to this day, this, my cores are still being used by other companies. You know, uh, it's just the way it is. I, I didn't patent them because that was not something we did at the time. You know, do you, now, do you wish you did patent them? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. But I might not be talking to you. I might have been <laughs> in Monte Carlo on, on a yacht. Right. I mean, you know. Right. Uh, uh, but, but you know what? I, I'm in a great spot. You know, I left uh, Columbia and started Dynathane um, and brought in the kangaroo shoes from Japan as a Dynathane shoes. And then Bill Crispin and I were partners in Dynathane, and then he sold that back to Columbia. Mm -hmm. And I went with it, <laughs> you right. know. So you know, um, changed hands a then, few times. Been been involved in some of the greatest yeah. technology to come. Yeah. yeah. Then I started Nine Hundred Global after I left. Uh, after Columbia sold all the brands. Okay. So, so so that's. I feel like that's a that's a good place to pause because I, okay. the next interview we're going to go to, we want to start where you're in the middle of moving from the one company to the other and starting 900 Global and leading up to sure. right before the radical revolution. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. Fantastic. Folks, sure. this is sure. part one of the interview with Phil Cardinelli. More to come. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Thank you. <laughs>